Good morning. Please turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 21. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 21, and we'll get there in a little, in a little bit. It's good to be back together with you. Good to be home. We had a good vacation over Christmas time, and it's always nice to, to be home as well. It's good to see everybody here this morning and to look into God's Word this morning, looking backward and looking forward, as you may have seen in the, in the sermon title. Junior high students, if you grab a clipboard at the back there, they're just blank pages today, but if you make an honest effort to write down some of the sermon points, you can help yourself to one of those candies at the back, as, as usual, for filling out those clipboards back there. Help yourself to one if you didn't get one already, just as we start to begin. Let's, uh, let's just pray for a few moments here together before we get into the sermon. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for Christmas time. Thank you for the hope and the joy and the peace that you bring, our Prince of Peace, as we just sang. We thank you for that, that song, and we thank you for the truth of, of the Christmas season and the, and the Prince of Peace coming to earth, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much that you came to earth, died on the cross eventually to pay for our sins and rose again. We are so thankful, Lord. We thank you for this season. Our, our hearts and prayers continue to be with those who, are, who have a difficult Christmas season because of recently losing loved ones or various different interruptions and difficulties in, in life, Lord. We lift them up to you. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would minister to each one and encourage each one by your grace. And Lord, our hearts and prayers go out to Christians around the world as we read different news reports of how in certain countries Christians are especially persecuted at Christmas time and uh, many have lost their lives and families have been disrupted. And Lord, we just pray for the persecuted church around the world. We pray for your peace to, to reign, Lord. We pray that the persecutors would become believers rather than hating the Lord Jesus and his followers. They would come to love the Lord Jesus and his followers and, and help those believers in other countries that are being persecuted to, to withstand with, uh, with peace in their hearts from your, your spirit and being a, a witness to, the, to their persecutors even while they're being thrown in jail and worse. Lord, our hearts just go out to, to uh, our brothers and sisters around the world. We're enjoying so much uh, peace and happiness here and I read these news reports and my heart just goes out to them. All of our hearts do, Lord, and so we pray again this morning for our brothers and sisters around the world. Give them the strength that they need, the grace that they need each day, Lord, and we pray that more and more we would see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, as we look now into this sermon, looking backward over this past year and looking forward to the future, we pray, Lord, that you would just open our hearts and minds to what you would like us to learn and, and receive from your word this morning and to remember and to keep applying the things we've learned over this past year and to press on into the future as well, Lord. Help us individually, each one of us, Lord, to press on and help us as a church family to keep pressing on, to be a, a light for the gospel here in Sudbury to be reaching out, to be helping people, to be a blessing to those around us, Lord. Help us to, to press on in every way to your honor and glory. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll get to Philippians 3, verse 12 and following shortly. As many of you know, I'm really into sports. I always enjoy watching the sports year in review shows this time of year. I like the highlights of the year. I enjoy the bloopers of the year as well. There's always lots of interesting sports things going on this time of year. Of course, this past year would be dominated by the Toronto Raptors World Championship run, and there's other interesting sports stories too. I find those year in review sports stories and show is very interesting. Some people might rather prefer a year in review show of American politics, but I would prefer a year in review of sports. Today we have a year in review of sermons. We're going to go through and highlight some of the things that we have studied together as a church family over this past year, and then we'll look forward to the future as well. Bit of unusual sermon, but you'll see as we get going. And I hope today's sermon will jog your memory. If you were here all of this past year, it will jog your memory and help you to keep applying 
applying the things that you've begun applying, even if you haven't consciously remembered everything. I'm sure we're applying very many things that we've learned this year. And if you're new to Lansing in the last few months, I hope that it would help you to, to hear about what you missed out on over the past year. And if anything in particular interests you, our sermons are all up online on our Lansing YouTube channel, and you could check out a whole sermon series or a sermon if you would like to do that. So the scripture reading today, as I mentioned, is Philippians 3, uh, 12 to 21. I'm not going verse by verse through the passage, but I'll read the passage and draw out a couple of verses and themes from the passage for this kind of year in review sermon and then looking forward in the second half as well. So let's read the passage, Philippians 3, 12 to 21, and then get into the sermon. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, of whom I have told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory. They glory in their shame with their minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enabled him even to subject all things to himself. When verse 16 says, only let us hold true to what we have attained, it implies that a key aspect to growing in the Lord, to growing in sanctification, to becoming more Christ-like, is to hold true to what we've already attained in the past. Or as the NIV says, only let us live up to what we've already attained. Let us live up to what we've already learned and attained. The idea is that some people are always wanting to learn something new at the exclusion to even living out what they've already learned in the past. I mean, some people always want to learn something new, and that's in many ways very good. I mean, I'm one of those people in many ways. I always want to learn something new. I know many of us, we want to learn something new. But some people are always wanting to learn something new while forgetting or not even intending or trying to live up to what they already know. And the Bible says, hold on. Before going on to something new, at least seek to hold on to and live up to what you've already attained. Live up to what you've already learned and done. Imagine an Olympic swimmer who specializes in the front crawl and does the front crawl at the Olympics. But he feels like he's been doing the front crawl for years, and so he wants to learn to do the butterfly instead. But in the process of learning how to do the butterfly, he kind of forgets how to do this, the front crawl really well. He's not on the top of his game anymore for the front crawl. Well, what good would that be if his Olympic race is the front crawl race? He will get beaten badly at the Olympics if he isn't holding on to the front crawl and practicing it daily. We need to keep doing and practicing what we've already attained and not just looking at, for something new at the exclusion to what we've already been doing or what we already know, what we've already learned. Imagine a Christian friend of yours here in this church family being a noticeably unloving person but saying that he or she wants to learn more about a new book of the Bible or what the hypostatic union is or more about end times or more about something else and just move on to something else and you might want to stop and say to your friend, hey, before learning about the hypostatic union or before studying end times, 
don't you think you should become more loving first? I mean, that's what we've been studying around here for the last few months. Or hey, before moving on to studying First Thessalonians in the new year, which we are going to do together in the new year, but before doing that, don't you think you should try to apply what you've already learned over the last several weeks about being a loving person? Why rush to learn something new if you're not even holding on to what you've already attained? Why the desire to learn something new when you're not going to apply it any more than what you've already heard and have not even tried to apply or remember? So I know we've learned a lot in these sermons these past, this past year, and I know it's hard to consciously remember everything that you've learned, and that's okay. Even if you can't consciously remember all of the sermons, I trust they've been applied into our lives and in various ways that we may not even always know or remember, but hopefully we certainly are all stronger in our faith and, and more Christ-like and, and, and love Christ more and are more loving than we were a year ago, and hopefully the same thing could be said at this time next year, that once again we've grown and more and more in our walk with Christ and we've made progress and pressed on further than where we were at this time this year when we talk about that next year. But to help in that, to help us to continue to press on and to grow, I think I want, I want to take us back through a little review of our sermons this past year. I won't ask you to shout out any answers, but think for a moment in your mind, what did we study in January this past year? What did we study together in January? I wasn't supposed to be funny, but I heard a few people laughing over here. <laughs> In January, we studied the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. And as elders at the time, we were planning the sermon series together, and we said, it's time to, to look at an Old Testament book of the Bible, and we looked at the book of Habakkuk for, the, uh, for January this past year. We learned lessons about, from Israel's history in that book that could be applied into our lives today, right here in the year 2019. For example, in Habakkuk, we learned how we can respectfully lament before God, because that's what Habakkuk does in that book. He, he laments before God, not in a bad way like Job, but in a respectful way, but very serious lament. And we learned that ultimately there's two different ways to live. You can live by faith or you can live by pride. That's what Habakkuk contrasted. You can live by faith or live by pride. And one of the most famous, well-known, well-repeated verses in the Bible we learned comes from Habakkuk, where we read the righteous will live by faith, the verse that is repeated numerous times in the New Testament, the righteous will live by faith. Next, this past year, Noting that we live in a world full of fear, we did a sermon series to help us combat fear and combat difficult times, and the series was called Faith Versus Fear, and the ongoing theme throughout it was the Red Sea Rules, based on the book by that title by Robert J. Haifman, which was then based on the Israelites' crossing of the Red Sea and Ten Rules for Life that he gleaned and we learned and, and I taught out of that book and out of Exodus chapter 14. All these, these rules for life, ten rules, Red Sea rules and concepts and principles based on the account of the crossing of the Red Sea in, Ex in Exodus chapter 14. And the ten rules were, I'll review them here with you. Number one, realize that God means for you to be where you are. Remember, the Israelites were stuck between the Red Sea and Pharaoh and mountains all around, nowhere to go. They were stuck there specifically, precisely because God had told them to go to that specific spot. Realize God means for you to be where you are, even when it's a difficult spot. One of the seniors in the church spoke to me after that message, I remember, and he said, and he's lived through many fearful, difficult things, and, and he said, you know, that's the key. That's the key. If by faith we can believe that God knows what he's doing, and that he wants us to be where we are, that's the key. That's, that's the number one rule. Realize that God means for you to be where you are. Number two, be more concerned for God's glory than for your relief. Number three, acknowledge your enemy, but keep your eyes on the Lord. Sometimes people acknowledge the Lord, but they keep their eyes on their fears and they keep their eyes on their difficulties. But this rule was saying, no, no, keep, you know, you have to acknowledge your problems. You got to acknowledge the fears and the difficulties, but keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus. Don't keep them on your fears. Don't keep them on your problems. Acknowledge them, but keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus was rule three. Number four was pray. Number five, stay calm and confident and give God time to work. Number six, when unsure, just take the next logical step by faith. 
when you don't completely know what to do next and you're afraid and you're in a hard time, just take one step at a time. Take the next logical step by faith. Number seven, envision God's enveloping presence. He is with you. He is for you. Envision and think about his enveloping presence. And number eight, trust God to deliver in his own unique way. Number nine, view your current crisis as a faith builder for the future your current crisis as a faith builder for the future. And number 10, don't forget to praise him. Those were the 10 Red Sea rules. And next was Pastor Jack's final sermon series as lead pastor at Lansing. Pastor Jack, of course, is still a pastor here and he preaches here. He's just preached last week and several times throughout the fall. But this, this was a special series in March because it was his last sermon series while being the lead pastor here before becoming the associate pastor and then the district shepherd for our fellowship in Northern Ontario. And so Pastor Jack took us back to the basics in that sermon asking, who is God? What is the gospel? What is the church? And it was a good series because it's important every once in a while to go back to the basics lest we forget them or take them for granted and then lose them as a result. By then we were in April together as a church family and the first Sunday in April was a unique Sunday where Pastor Jack preached and then he got my dad who's a retired pastor to come up and preach as well. There was two short sermons that Sunday as I was installed as the lead pastor here and then the rest of April I preached on the Gospel of John and the passages in the Gospel of John related to Easter. Then last spring in, and in, in May and June, we looked at the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation. And we're getting more close to, to you might ring a bell a little bit more now because that wasn't so long ago. Themes in those seven letters to this, in those seven sermons included in the first letter to Ephesus, the call to return to our first love for God and each other, and the truth that God not only knows in each letter, actually, the truth that not only does God know our hearts, but he knows our works. Every letter he says, I know your works. I know your works. And we talk a lot about how God knows our hearts. Of course God knows our hearts. He also knows our works. And in those letters he wanted to say, no, obviously we're not saved by works, but he expects our lives to be devoted to good works. And he says, I know your works. I know your works in every letter. In the letter to Smyrna, we learned that you can be rich in Christ and faithful to Christ even while being materially poor or physically persecuted as so many Christians around the world are. In the letter to Pergamum, there was a warning against false teachers. And then in the letter to Thyatira, another warning against false teachers, which just reminded me again and again how often the Bible warns against false teachers, which is just, it comes up all the time. And it's amazing because there are teachers out there nowadays that will say, there are no false teachers. It's all just different perspectives and different ideas. And we can't know for sure, but there's no such thing as false teachers. Everything's okay. Well, why does the Bible warn against false teachers repeatedly? time after time, it's because there are false teachers out there and we need to be careful and be on guard against false teaching. And in Thyatira as well was a commendation to those who are faithful with love and faith and servants and patient, patient endurance. Then in the letter to Sardis, we saw how some people's reputation does not actually match what God really knows to be true. God really knows the truth. Then in the letter to Philadelphia, mainly a commendation to those who had kept God's word. And in the letter to Laodicea, the most hard-hitting and well-known of all the letters, a, a warning against lukewarmness. And in each of these seven letters, there was always a call to repent and to return to the Lord, culminating with Revelation 3.20, saying, where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. By then it was summertime and we preached on various different psalms throughout the summertime as a celebration of having finished reading the entire book of psalms one chapter at a time as a church family over the past three years. We had read the book of psalms, finished that just before the summertime and so we preached on various of our favorite or some unique psalms there in celebration of having finished reading the whole entire book which was a, uh, which was a plan that our late great friend and former elder named Greg Warnock had come up with a few years ago. He has since passed and we miss him, but he had come up with that plan and then we preached on those psalms kind of in, uh, in honor and in memory of that as well. 
Then in then this fall, not very long ago, so hopefully many of you remember, we preached our sermon series on the Shema, where we looked at that famous Shema from the Old Testament, the phrase, the phrase by phrase going through Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5, where we read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And then we looked at how in the New Testament Jesus calls this Old Testament Shema the greatest commandment and says the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then most recently, of course, was our very recent sermon series on the most excellent way, the way of love, where we spent most of our time focused in 1 Corinthians 13, especially verses 4 to 7, which say, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then we also looked in that series about how love shows hospitality and love cares and love prays for other people. If we could hold true to what we've already attained, what we've attained or what we've learned and begun to apply, even let just in this past year, let alone the year before and the year before and the year before, if we could hold true to what we already know, we would be doing pretty well. We learn a lot around here every week. If we could live up to what we've learned on Sunday mornings this past year, we'd be doing well. And Philippians 3.16 says, let us hold true to what we have already attained. So that's our looking back part of the sermon today. Hope that jogged your memory in various different ways of some of the sermons around here. Now let's look forward because earlier in Philippians 3 in the passage in verses 12 to 15 we read, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies ahead behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And Paul writes there at the start of verse 12, not that I've already obtained this. What's he talking about not having obtained? Well, it says, not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect. He's talking about he hasn't really attained the full and complete prize of his salvation culminating in the resurrection from the dead and in full perfection. He hasn't already obtained that perfection. He says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but what does he do? I press on. I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He presses on. Now notice very carefully that the foundation from which he presses on is the gospel. He says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Through his faith in the gospel message that Jesus Christ has died for his sins and risen again, and through the fact that he now belongs to Christ, he is able to press on. He says, it's because Christ Jesus has made me his own that he can press on. Every step forward in the Christian life is a step forward with Christ through the gospel because of union with Christ and because of the gospel. Whenever you think or hear about pressing on, make sure you know you're never pressing on from the gospel. You don't leave the gospel behind and then press on into just works and service. It's always pressing on with the gospel into a deeper application of the gospel. You never ever move on from the gospel. You press on with the gospel. It's the foundation. It's the power. The gospel of Christ's death and resurrection both saves us and then empowers us to press on and grow more loving and grow more Christ-like and more obedient. Because of the gospel, Paul presses on in his Christian life. 
saying then as we read, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now wait a second, why does he say forgetting what lies behind? You might notice me read that a few times and said, didn't we just look at what lies behind? Didn't we just review the, the past? Why does he say forgetting what lies behind? Are we supposed to forget or are we supposed to remember? What are we supposed to do here? Is it, didn't we just review this past year because we shouldn't forget? Obviously we shouldn't forget the Bible teaching and the things of the Lord that we have learned in the past and that applies into our lives today. Obviously, we also shouldn't forget how to do the math that we learned in grade school. We shouldn't forget how to change a light bulb or drive a car or forget our mom's birthday. I know that one from experience. Obviously, the verse doesn't mean to forget those kind of things. You don't forget those kind of things when it says to forget what lies behind. We should remember all those things. And trust me, it's not good to forget your mom's birthday. And apparently calling her a week later and remembering doesn't count. It's supposed to be on the exact day. And don't try to pretend that you purposely waited a week longer to make it a more special phone call because she won't believe that for a second. But of course, we shouldn't forget normal things. We shouldn't forget Bible teaching. But why does Paul say forgetting what lies behind then? What exactly are we forgetting? If we're not forgetting our Bible, we're not forgetting what we've learned, we're not forgetting normal things in life, what are we forgetting? Well, let me tell you what else, what we are supposed to forget. What else, besides those things, we should forget, I'll, I'll just say it in one word, everything. Everything. Everything else. We should forget everything else. The good things we've done and the bad things we've done, that's what we should forget. Everything. The good and the bad that we've done. John MacArthur, when preaching on this passage, says, now what does he mean when he says the past? Forgetting those things that are behind. What things? Everything. Now follow this, okay? Good things and bad things. Achievements, virtuous deeds, great accomplishments, spiritual ministries, as well as bad things. Sins, iniquities, failures, disasters, all of it. You say, forget it all? That's right. Why? Because it has nothing to do with the future. Did you understand that? It has nothing to do with what you're doing right now. Nothing to do with it. You cannot live on past victories. You cannot celebrate your value by your past. And you should never be uh, debilitated by your past sins, iniquities, and burdens. And yet, most people are so much distracted by the past that they never get around to running the future. End quote. Now understand, forget the past accomplishments that would make you proud and forget the past sins and failures that would cause you to feel, feel guilty or to paralyze you and just press on into the future. If all you're thinking about is your accomplishments from the past and how much you've served the Lord and how great you've done, and you're, you'll end up resting on your laurels, as they say, instead of growing. You'll stop growing into the future and you'll just stay where you are. So don't go, go proud about the past. Remember that every good thing you or I have done is ultimately thanks to Jesus and he should get all the glory, not you or I. And we should just forget it and move on and press on rather than growing proud. On the other hand, if you're paralyzed by guilt or regret over the past, that will negatively affect your future. So don't dwell on that in any way either. Remember, remember that every sin is forgiven once it's confessed to Jesus Christ who died on the cross to pay for our sins and forgive the sins of those who trust in him. So instead of focusing on the past, the good or the bad, focus on the future. Strain and press on forward to greater maturity in Christ. Press on for the prize like a sprinter. Can you imagine the world's greatest sprinter, Usain Bolt, about to run the 100-meter dash and thinking to himself, I don't have to try my best. I'm already so fast. I've already won a number of times in the past. I don't need to grow. I don't need to improve. I'm just fine. That would be silly. He's going to lose the race, obviously, if that's his mentality going into it. He needs to be focused on the future race. You need to focus on the future. On the other hand, imagine a sprinter who just lost a recent race because he stepped out of bounds partway through and he's in the blocks now and he's thinking to himself, I lost in the past. 
stepped out of my lane last time. I was guilty, no doubt about it. Same thing's probably going to happen again. How's he going to do in the race? He's going to lose as well. If he's dwelling on the past and that kind of negative and mistakes of the past, he's going to lose. Forget the past, the good and the bad. Forget it. Press on to the future. Strain forward to what lies ahead, verse 13 says. Press on toward the goal for the prize, verse 14 said. Now sometimes we have to deal with past issues and scars. Forgetting the past doesn't mean bottling everything up inside until we get sick. So don't understand, don't misunderstand this. It doesn't mean bottle things up. We probably all have some issues and scars from the past we need to work through or, or talk through. But this verse is meaning don't live in the past in good or bad ways. Don't rest on how you've served God in the past. Focus on serving Him in the future. Don't get paralyzed by past sin and guilt. Focus on the future and moving forward by grace. Because for today on, the future is what matters. We need to look to the future and press on to follow Christ more nearly and to love Christ more dearly. The future is what matters. They say sometimes people that have served the Lord for many, many years can get to this point where they kind of feel like, well, I've been serving the Lord for years, maybe decades, every Sunday or every Wednesday. This year, I'm just going to take this year for myself. This is a me year. Well, wait a second. The Bible says forget what lies behind. Just start over. Start afresh each day and each year. Don't, don't say I've served so much that now it's about me. Say I forget all of that and I'm starting over blank slate and I am going to serve God this coming year with passion and excellence. I'm going to grow to love Christ more dearly and follow Christ more nearly and seek to see him more clearly. Don't rest on the past in the good way. Don't get paralyzed by the past in the bad way. Forget it at all. Press on. Press on. Press on. So in conclusion, we should look back and we should look forward. There's lots about the past that we should not dwell on, but we should look back on those things that we've learned and should seek by God's grace and power in our lives to keep applying those things to the glory of God and for the advancement of His kingdom and for our growth in our Christian life. We should remember God's faithfulness. There's many numerous calls in the Bible to remember God's past faithfulness. There's much we should remember about the past and what God has done for us. But other than that, keep your eyes focused forward. Focus like a sprinter running a race. Don't bother looking back. Don't even look side to side. Just press on looking forward in the Christian life. Don't rest on your past accomplishments. Don't be paralyzed by your past sins. Press on in the gospel and by the gospel to the glory of God. Let's pray to close the sermon. Lord God, thank you for your faithfulness to us in the past, and we know you will be faithful in the future as well. Lord, as we looked back on some of the lessons we've learned, those Red Sea rules and lessons from Habakkuk and lessons from the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation and talking about loving you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength and loving our neighbor, becoming more loving people. Lord, help us to remember those things. And even when we don't consciously remember them, Lord, help them to apply into our lives, just to just become a, a new part of how we live our lives every day. And Lord, other than the good things, other than the, the lessons we've learned and the normal things of life, help us to forget the past. Help us to forget how good we've been or how bad we've been and to realize that today is a new day. 2020 is a new year. Help us to look forward to this new year with eager anticipation to press on, not being paralyzed by the bad things we've done in the past, not being puffed up with pride or relaxing because we've been so good in the past, but just pressing on to serve you, to follow you, to grow, to love you more. Lord God, help each one of us to love you more dearly with each passing day, with each passing year. Help us to press on to, to love you more and to, uh, to follow you and to glorify you. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.